PH, GH, KH. What are all these terms and how important are they to your pond? G'day, my name is Kev. The aim of my channel is to help people build and maintain ponds without spending a fortune. If that sounds like something that interests you, please like, subscribe and check out my website, ozponds.com. So pH refers to the amount of hydrogen ions within the water. Most freshwater fish are quite happy in pH between 6.5 and 8. And the pH of most drinking water falls within this range. GH is the general hardness of the water. This is measured by the amount of calcium and magnesium in the water. KH is the carbonate hardness of the water. So the amount of carbonates in the water. So just how important are these readings for your pond? I recently made a video talking about how I hardly ever feed my pond fish. As those of you who regularly watch my videos know I prefer an ecosystem style of pond where I basically let nature take care of most of the work. Anyway, on that video, I received an interesting comment from a viewer. This is what Blair had to say. A balanced ecosystem is important, but it is important to watch levels in a contained system. The bacteria that break down the ammonia and fish waste consume the carbonate hardness from the water as part of their life cycle. Rainwater falling in the pond is also very soft and lowers the KH. If it gets low enough, your pH drops rapidly and both the important bacteria and your favorite fish die. So there's a lot of good stuff in here and it's pretty much true. The bacteria that we rely on keep the water safe for the fish and they do consume carbonates. And remember KH is the measurement of the carbonates and bicarbonates that are dissolved within the water. KH acts as what they call a buffer. It protects your pond or aquarium from wild pH swings. <laughs> now I don't want to scare anyone off with all the science. Uh, I mean, my eyes glaze over a little. <laughs> um, it's all a little bit too complex. So my personal philosophy is I don't even worry about the KH. Like I've always said, I'm a lazy pond keeper and believe that if I set up a well-functioning ecosystem, nature will take care of things for me. If the pond isn't overstocked with fish, the demands for carbonates from the bacteria should be minimal anyway. Plus, when you have good air exchange, carbon dioxide is entering the water from the atmosphere and then becomes carbonate once it enters the water column. Here's a little excerpt from a website that loves to deep dive into the science of fish keeping. So as I mentioned in the fish feeding video, if you overfeed the fish, you put extra pressure on the bacteria that are the backbone of the entire filtration system. If the bacteria need to process more ammonia and nitrite, they will consume carbonates within the water, which could potentially affect the KH, which is keeping the pond pH stable. You can buy test kits that will test your KH. If you're worried, I'll link them in the description. But because I don't overstock or overfeed my fish, it's not something I'm worried about. If it comes back to bite me, you guys will be the first to know. So Blair had lots of good stuff to say. He then writes, Owners of every fish tank or pond I ever visited that say I don't need to do anything will admit after I test their system that from time to time they have fish die off. They also don't realise that fish growth is retarded by hormones that build up in the water. Never doing water changes is not good for fish health. It limits their growth and shortens their life as proven in top end setups where goldfish grow 18 to 24 centimetres in 24 months. They will get to 30 to 40 centimetres if the water is healthy for them. If they stay small for years, it's because of poor water quality and conditions. So even though I advocate for a more hands-off approach, I don't do nothing to my pond. <laughs> I do bugger all, but I do monitor them daily Visually, not fire test as such. 
I personally haven't had a die off in my ponds. However, when I attempted aquaponics years ago, I did have a die off event. In aquaponics, there's very high fish densities. This is to try and produce the amount of nutrients needed for the plants to grow. So a completely different style of pond and fish keeping to what I do now. I found aquaponics way too hands-on and labour intensive for my particular style. So as for the hormones that are released, this is true. Carp species like goldfish and even um, salmonoids like trout can produce hormones that will stunt their growth. When I try and research this, there's varying opinions and not a lot of scientific information available. At least not information that my tiny brain can easily digest. So I tend to rely more on what I see and observe in my own ponds. This goldfish here was one of four stowaways in a water lily pot. I purchased two water lilies about six months before I built this pond. The lilies sat on the veranda for about six months with about four inches of water in them. No oxygen, no water changes, I didn't even know the fish were in there. Once I put the lilies in and filled up, I found these four goldfish. They were all brown and about two and a half inches long. That was three years ago. They've all grown a little, they're probably four inches long now, and they've all turned gold. I guess the point of the story is that if they couldn't regulate their growth, they would have died in that lily pot. So it seems to me it's more a survival instinct than an indicator of poor health, but that's just my opinion. I also personally don't think it's helpful to associate growth and weight gain with healthy livestock. You only need to look at how quickly we can fatten up animals we produce for human consumption. Just because we can grow something on quickly doesn't mean we should. And I personally could consume more calories and put on weight. Does that make me a more healthy person? I don't think so. And that's not to say you should starve your livestock either. But these goldfish aren't huge, but they look happy and vibrant and healthy to me. So then we come to the water changes. Again, I'm all about trying to recreate ecosystems, so no water changes for me. If we look at how water moves in nature, we can recreate certain aspects to help purify the water in our ponds. In nature, water evaporates, falls back to earth as rain, snow, fog, etc. It runs over rocks and soils, it percolates into the ground, it finds its way into rivers and streams, lakes, wetlands, the oceans and aquifers. As it does that, it's picking up all kinds of nutrients and minerals. If I can replicate some of this type of water movement in my ponds, I should be good. And so far, that's been my experience. This pond has a bog filter, which recreates a wetland environment. It also has a stream. There's plants, rocks and fish. As the water moves through the system, it picks up little bits and pieces and loses other little bits and pieces. Throughout the entire journey, there are probably billions of tiny bacterias and organisms interacting naturally with the water, just as they would in different watersheds all over the world. So at the end of the day, there are loads of different ways that people successfully maintain and build ponds and aquariums. I just use this channel to show what I do. Someone once said to me, find someone whose style of fish keeping you like and replicate it. If you like how I build and maintain my ponds, then follow along and learn with me. If you find more truth in what others say, follow them. There's a wealth of knowledge out there. Go and learn as little or as much as you want. Water chemistry seems so complex to me. I don't know how anyone could ever learn everything in one lifetime. I just try not to overcomplicate or worry too much. The ecosystem knows what it's doing. I'll just take a step back and enjoy my ponds. I hope this video has helped some of you. If it has, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.